Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of Springfield USA. I'm Dan Gummel, this is Chad Wilson, and we're broadcasting out of Empire Studios in Commerce Point Building in historic downtown Springfield. This is the show where we talk all things Champion City, Springfield, Ohio. Our guest on the show today is Rick White. He's a major leaguer, he's a legend, and he's awesome. Chad, I'm stoked for the episode today. I'm stoked, let's do it. Dude, let's roll. Welcome to Springfield USA. Everyone, we're back, and our guest on the show, like I mentioned, is Rick White. He's a major leaguer, and uh, he loves Springfield. Rick, welcome to the show today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Welcome to Springfield, USA. So, Rick, you grew up here in town. Uh, I think if I my research was right, you were the first guy to come out of Springfield, uh, out of Kenton Ridge, to make it to the major leagues. Tell us about your your journey growing up, playing ball, and and how you made it to the show. Well, I am going to have to correct you on that. Just Dave because that's how we do it in Springfield. Okay. Dave Burba was ahead of me. Dave Burba was ahead of you? Yeah. Okay. But we did go to the same high school. Dave graduated in 84. I graduated in 87. Then Dustin Hermanson graduated in 89. And then it went on down to Bealsey was 88. But Bealsey didn't make it to the big leagues. But we all went pro. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Bennett, believe now Adam Eaton's the last one. And we still have Derek Toadvine from Kent Ridge uh, in the Yankees organization. So okay. that's pretty cool. What was it like? I mean, did you were you one of the boys who like you you just had dreams of, of playing major league ball someday? Or? Um, growing up, I played baseball my whole life. Yeah. Um, I was always a little bit better than a lot of guys. Um, I played multiple positions too. I actually like to hit. You know, it's like you see in the big leagues, the hitters always want to do something different while well, the pitchers always want to be able to hit. Well, they took that away from me when I got to college. Apparently, I wasn't as good a hitter as I thought I was. But um, <clears throat> it was just one of those things where I didn't really know going out of high school what I wanted to do. I literally barely graduated from high school. I had like the lowest possible <laughs> GPA that you could get. You heard it here. And then when I ended up going to this JUCO in Paducah, Kentucky, um, I got my stuff together. I ended up with a 357, got a full ride to go to Southern Mississippi University to play baseball, and got drafted at the same time. So I had to make a choice, and my choice was to go pro, and it led to good things. That's awesome. Well, Rick, the first time I met you was actually in a different setting. It was uh, I was a wildlife officer for the state of Ohio. I was wet behind the ears. Just got my new state truck and I was rolling through Champaign County and I ran into you coming out of a farm. You had been hunting and we talked a little bit about hunting. I introduced myself to you. Of course, I knew you. I was friends with uh, Tom Randall's son uh, growing up and you know we always had these uh, these legends. You know these guys you spoke of at Kitten Ridge and uh, man, um, we have that. We share that love of the outdoors and we share that love of hunting. And, and so flash forward 15 years and I run into you again in the woods. And you, you shared something with me. You said, you know, Chad, you said, I miss the show sometimes. I miss it. Mm. And uh, can you tell our listeners today what it is? What's the essence of it? You know, what is it like to step out on the field? What do you miss about it? The easiest way to answer that question, and anybody that's dealt with adrenaline knows the adrenaline rush. Um, when you, like especially as a reliever, when you bust through that bullpen gate, and they called the, the phone rang and they're like, okay, you're on. You both through that gate and you start running out there and, and there's 30 to 60,000, 70,000, however big the stadium is, full of people. And you're jogging out there, hoping that you don't trip and fall on the way in there. So Did you ever trip saying. and fall? No, I didn't. <laughs> but I tried to run fast sometimes and I got out of breath. So I, I tried to just tr find that cool jog, you know, that can just get me out there. But um, I'm the, yeah, the <laughs> adrenaline was was the part that really got you going. Um, just the fact that now that I'm retired, I'm watching all the guys I play with go into the Hall of Fame getting inducted. Mm -hmm. The Biggios and, the, and uh, Maddoxes and Johnsons and all those guys like that, those are guys that I played with. I mean, it kind of makes me feel old that they're getting inducted in the Hall of Fame, but it also is cool that I got to play with all those mm -hmm. guys. Mm -hmm. So to be able to go out there and get on the mound and sit there and look and say, Oh my God! I got freaking guys on second, third, and I got Mark McGuire at the plate. Yeah. I'm like, ooh. Do you smell, do you smell the grass? Do you, do, you, do you smell cigars coming from the audience? <laughs> I mean, what do, what do you? Are you focused? Is it like a laser? At the very beginning of my career, you can hear a lot. Mm. 
And then somehow you just train yourself to block everything out and you don't hear anything until, until you get that last out and you start walking off the field is when you start hearing the people above the dugouts yelling at you and stuff like that. But for, something happens, they call it the zone and being able to block things out. Um, when you get out there, if you train yourself to, to block it out, you literally don't hear people. Um, you can hear the catcher yelling back and forth at you. You can hear your players, but you can't hear the fans. That's it's amazing. Kinda, yeah, it's like having some sort of special headphones on. Mm. Um, the zone that you've heard people talk about. Mm. I got into that zone in the winter of 93 before I made it to the big leagues. I got I got put on the roster in the spring of 94. That was my first big league spring training and made the team out of spring training. I went from – I was playing Puerto Rican uh, winter ball down in Puerto Rico. I got really sick, got food poisoning. Um, I was in the hospital for two weeks, came out of the hospital. Um, they gave me a bunch of B12 to try to get me energy going again, started working out. And next thing you know, I went from throwing 92, 93 to 98, 99. And I just got into this zone to where I can, when I let go of the ball, I could see exactly where it was going. I can see what the hitter, when he was swinging, if the ball was going to miss his bat. It was the most unbelievable thing that I've ever experienced. Wow. And I carried that all the way through half of 94 into June of 94. Um, and everybody kept asking, you know, how, did, how are you doing it? What'd you do? I was like, I don't know. It just happened. Mm. I never got back in that zone. That one particular zone where you could see every little tiny micro of what was going on, never got back into it. But in 2007, uh, when I was with Houston, I was kind of there because I could see when people were going to swing and miss. I wasn't like lock, lock like I was that one year, but 97 was probably my start of, if not my best year. I didn't give up a run the entire spring with Houston. I didn't give up a run until May, end of May, going into June. Um, that year, and then I ended up getting a, a herniated disc in my neck and couldn't feel the ball. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what started the downside of my career. Tell me, uh, tell me like a story that, that you remember. <laughs> like, like what, what was the first time like stepping out on the mound? The first time, well, the, I remember the first two times, actually. The first time uh, was my first chance I had to pitch when I was with Pittsburgh in 1994. We were playing at Candlestick Park against San Francisco Giants. Well, if you can remember back that far, which you guys are kind of young, um, the three hitters that I had to face to come in to get the save was Barry Bonds, Kevin Mitchell, and Matt Williams. And Will Clark was uh, on deck in the four hole. And I had to try to get three outs and we were only up one run. And I remembered the first batter I faced was Matt Williams, and he hit a ball right back by my foot, and I went down to get it, and I, I got mad, and I turned around, and our second baseman was standing right there. They had had the shift on. Back in 1994, when we didn't even really do shifts, and he was standing right there and caught through it, I was like, oh, okay, I got a defense back here, so I don't have to do this. And then I ended up doing it through that, but um, that worked out good. I got my first save, but then the next one we Wait, went so did to, you get Barry Bonds out? Yes. No. I actually did very good against Barry Bonds my entire career. Really? And yes, I did. Um, but the, the funny thing was, is my next one that we went to, Colorado, and that's one when they played at Mile High Stadium before Coors Field came around. And it was an old – there was football, so you had one side and one side. Well, I got out there, and they were yelling back and forth. The fans were. So I started I started going back and forth on the mound. When they yelled this way, I'd go this way. When they yelled, And I was just rocking. And the umpire told the catcher, uh, Don Slide, goes, go out and tell him to quit moving. Because I was going to get called for a balk, and I was going to end up losing the game on a balk because I was sitting there going back with a tomahawk chop back when, when they did that. Um, but yeah, it was, um, like I said, it's hard to explain it until you get in, in front of everybody and feel it. But, um, that's the kind of stuff I missed about the game. Who's the toughest batter you faced in your career? I get that a lot. And there, and there's a lot of, believe it or not, the power hitters aren't the toughest ones. Really? No, because they usually have a big enough swing that you can get inside or get away from them. Um, Wade Boggs was tough. Tony Gwynn was tough. Your 300 lifetime hitters that would sit there and foul the ball off until they got what they wanted. Um, I remember my rookie year, I had to face Tony Gwynn, bases loaded. We're down one or we're up one run, bases loaded, two outs. They bring me in the game. They didn't want to bring me in because I just threw two days in a row. He had done fouled off 15 pitches. And Don Slot came out and goes, What do you want to do? 
I was like, it's 3-2. I said, I don't want to serve up a fastball right here. I said, I'm going to throw a split right down the middle. I haven't thrown a split the entire season. Nobody knows I throw it, and let's see what happens. He hit it for a triple, bases clearing triple down, <laughs> down the first baseline, and he come out after that. He goes, well, that didn't work. <laughs> but he was probably that's the overall toughest. Yeah, yeah, that's why he's a Hall of Famer, exactly. Uh, so you threw a split. I did. Well, I, I ended up having Tommy John from it, so then I didn't throw it again until the very end of my career. So. It was one of those things where I, I, it was more like a very hard forkball, knuckleball type thing. Yeah. And it was really hard to control. So I didn't throw it that much. But when I did, it, it ended up messing up my elbow. So yeah. I had Tommy John in December of 94 uh, and was back ready to go in 96. Rick, uh, my brother was an all state pitcher for Kitten Ridge. And uh, I remember him coming home from school one time and he said, Hey, Rick White was at school today and uh, he was doing a pitching clinic and you were placing the ball um, on, on, you would you would call where you would place the ball, and he was just fascinated the control that you had. Um, can you speak to how you developed that control from a high school kid to, you know, through that? It was I think, um, and I tell my son this now because I try to get him to play a little bit more baseball. He's he's more into the the bowling, basketball stuff like that. But um, back when I was a kid, they had this thing called the Johnny Bench Throwback. We had that out in my backyard, and every day I would go out there and throw and try to hit different spots on that net and just work on catching the ball, work on my mechanics. And that's how my dad taught me to, to go out and be able to do it because he played softball a lot. So he goes, if you go out here and throw, and I started actually when I was a kid, I had really good control. Mm -hmm. And it just kept developing and developing. And I didn't even really learn how to pitch until right at the end of my career. I knew how to throw. I knew to throw the spots and stuff, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just throwing. But it took, you know, over 10 years in the big leagues to even get to where I knew how to really pitch and set up hitters. Pitchers are known for being a little rambunctious at times. So um, there's a funny story about the last game you played in. Can you tell our listeners about that? Yeah. Um, that year, again, 2007, I was with Houston, got hurt, went home. Home for the 4th of July, Seattle Seahawks, or the Seattle Seahawks, yeah, want me to play football. Um, the, <laughs> the, Mariner, to play. <laughs> yeah, the Mariners called me up, and they're like, hey, you want to come and pitch for us the second half? You know, we got to, we're pushing ourselves to the playoffs right here. We want you to come help us out. I said, I have a hurt neck. I haven't done anything for three weeks. I said, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> they said, you come out here for two weeks, rehab, throw in, throw in AAA for two weeks, and then you'll be up and – Hopefully we can make it to the playoffs. I said okay, <clears throat> so I go down there, do all that stuff, get up, get to the big leagues. I'm in my third game in the big leagues. We're in New York against the Yankees. <clears throat> we had a rookie starter, can't remember who it was at the time, and two other rookie relievers come in before me because I was at the end of the bullpen. Well, they called down and said, "Get me, get wide up." <clears throat> so they get me up. I go give me the phone. So I get on the phone. And goes, hey, when you get in there, if they squeeze you, we want you to get ejected because they're screwing our pitchers right now. I said, okay. So get warmed up, get in the game. Second pitch to Jorge Posada was a fastball right down the middle, and the umpire called a ball. Mm. So I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? You know, in nice terms, in a censored <laughs> way, a bleeping right mean, and and. I said, you're out of your bleeping mind. And he gets, he's trying to, he's like, what? I was like, you're out of your bleeping mind. It's right down the middle. So he's getting ready to throw me out of the game, right? Oh, and he goes to throw me out of the game. Kenji Jojima, the Japanese catcher, grabs a hold of his arm. So he's sitting there trying to throw me out like this. So I'm like, and now I'm just letting him have it. So he finally gets away and throws me out. So I go back and stand on the mouse. So I ain't freaking leaving. So now the manager comes out and they're going at it and everything. So the umpires finally get him separate. I'm still standing on the mound. I've got the ball. And the umpire goes, let's go, Rick, you're out of here. I was like, all right, fine. Well, you could take this and shove it. And I rolled the ball from the mound right across the freaking plate. It was perfect, like a strike. And <laughs> Jojima picked it up and handed it to him. And that was how I walked off the field. And that was the last ball I ever threw in the big leagues because wow. I got released the next day. <laughs> wow. Were the were the Yankees like? Did they? I mean, everybody was laughing usually... at it. Yeah, everybody laughed at the whole thing because they already knew what was going on. Then when I rolled that ball, everybody was like in shock, and then everybody started talking about how funny that was. They played it for for days after that, and I have no idea where the video went. But oh, I, I always wanted to look at it because I never got to see it. Yeah, that's a challenge to you, ESPN. If you're listening, we need to find that footage. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got something here that there's a lot of people in the world that would probably be love that would love to hold what I'm holding right now 
especially a lot of people in New York. Um, tell me about tell me about the ring and tell me about the series and, and that's the uh, that's the World Series ring. It's the uh, National League Championship ring from 2000, the Subway Series. Um, as I was telling you before the show, I'd loved would have loved to have seen what the Yankees' actual championship ring looked like. It's probably twice that big with yeah. twice as many diamonds because you know how the Yankees <laughs> are. But um, it was one of those things. I was having a really good uh, season in 2000 um, with the with Tampa Bay. And I ended up getting traded uh, with a kid named Bubba Trammell uh, to the Mets that year. And we ended up going to the World Series. And that was the first World Series, first postseason I've ever played in. And, uh, you know, I would love to be able to tell you a lot about it. But it was one of those things that was so crazy that I wish I'd have filmed everything. Um, I remember the city shutting down, literally. Like, we would leave to go from Shea <clears throat> to the Bronx. And they would shut down every highway. And really? we would get on these buses to go travel across there, and there was no cars on the road except for our buses going across. <sighs> and everybody's standing all down the side of the highways on the on-ramps and off-ramps. Everybody's waving flags. It was like you just got back from winning a major war or something like that, and everybody was welcoming everybody. It was the most unbelievable, surreal thing I've ever been involved right. in. The stands, the people that were in there, everything was packed. You can go out to eat lunch. You didn't have to pay for anything. People would come up to you and be like, hey, good luck in the World Series, man. This is you know, this is on us. Go get them. And it, the whole thing was just like the presidential VIP treatment that you could possibly ask for. Wow. And I remember pitching in a game that, um, I don't know if you remember that or not, but that's the game that, that uh, Clemens threw the bat at Piazza. Right. Well, that was like we, in the first inning, right? <laughs> first or second inning, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was early yeah. enough to where we were all, the relievers were all still sitting up in the clubhouse. Right. We, you know, we were still getting worked on and getting ready to go out to the bullpen. Yeah. And Franco goes, let's go, boys. Pitches are clearing. So we all start running down the thing. We get out there, and everybody's already done. Because we had to go through the thing, down the tunnel, back up and out on yeah, the field. Yeah. And everything's already stopped. Yeah. And it's like, we're in a World Series. And everybody's, like, freaking going nuts. And what happened? He threw the bat at him. I'm like, Clemens is out there. He had no idea what he did. I mean, he was so focused on what he was doing that he looked like he was he, yeah, I he remember, was in another world. I remember I, I watched the YouTube highlight, actually, recently. Um and he, he's mouthing. He's like, I thought it was the ball. Right. And everybody's and like, you don't throw the ball at the batter either. Don't throw either. the ball at the batter either. <laughs> this is a very sharp, pointed, broken yeah. bat, you know? Yeah. He threw a and, shard at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, but so that, that all ended up going away pretty quick. So we went back up, and everybody's like, all right, we got to hurry up and get ready and get down to the bullpen in case something else happens. Well, I think the fifth or sixth inning, they called and got me up. And I ended up coming in that game after Hampton came out. And I did pretty good. I ended up giving a, a broken bat single. They took me out of the game, and then the next guy came in and flushed my run. But that was my first game I ever pitched in a postseason. Was in a, was, or besides the championships and stuff like that, was that was a, an inning would have been scoreless. But I ended up giving up a broken bat single, and that guy ended up coming around to score. But in the World Series, in the World Series of the game that Piazza threw the bat, and it was like, okay, that's cool. So is that? I mean, is that? Is that? What's that mean to you? The ring. Or just the, just the, the whole, whole experience. Just the whole yeah. experience. A lot of hard work paid off. Yeah. You know, it's like I said, I, I barely graduated high school. When I graduated high school, I was six foot tall, 160 pounds is what I wrestled my senior year. And the first year I got to college, I grew three inches and put on 60 pounds. Yeah. And I just worked and worked and worked. And um, I, I like to say that I'm in decent shape now. I'm in terrible cardio shape right now, but I'm stronger now than I ever was when I played. Mm. I still work out. I still try to stay in shape, and and that's what I try to teach kids now. You know, everybody's like, "How can I throw 90 miles an hour?" Well, you can't. You have to work at it. Mm. You're either you're going to be born with that gift of being able to throw, but you have to be able to work and work and work to get it harder and harder and harder. You can't just automatically do one thing and be like, "Yeah, I'm throwing 90." You know, you just got to work and work, and that's one thing I try to teach the kids now. Yeah. So. Rick, we, Chad and I, we started this podcast because he and I are both very interested in speaking good words about our city, about yeah. Springfield, and we know that you're very involved here in town. You were at Wittenberg for a while, now you're with the Kings, uh, if, I, if I understand. Tell me about, you know, what Springfield means to you and, and why, why Springfield for you when, when there are definitely other options on the table. I've had, I've had uh, heck, even my friends when I come back, even when I was playing, I came home every winter, always came back home, always had a place here. Um, 
and I was telling you guys before, I still run around with the same guys I grew up with when I, from when I was a kid. My family's all here. I've got a couple aunts and uncles that live out of town, but my main family's here. My best friends are here. Um, all of our kids grew up together here. Um, I could have went and lived on a beach somewhere, lived in a warmer state. I like the transactions of the weather uh, for the hunting and the fishing and all that. Um, I played in a, every big city. Um, yeah. I don't like that. I don't like having to sit in a traffic jam for an hour. I don't like having to go three hours early to get somewhere or three hours get home three hours late because you got stuck somewhere. You couldn't get a ride. You know, just, you can get from one side of Springfield to the other in 20 minutes. And to me, that's pretty cool. And the city is, from just the time that I've retired in 2008 up until now, has made dramatic changes in its face appearance anyway. Mm -hmm. The cosmetic stuff we're doing, the chiller, the the water rides, and the rapper, the the river, the bridges they're redoing. The, everything is turning around in this city, mm. and the only way that that that's going to happen and keep happening is if we all stay here and we help it. I love taking my kids to the the Champion City Kings games. Can you tell us a little bit about that organization and how it started, and what your involvement is with it? Yeah, it uh, started here two years ago. Um, it's in the Prospect League, and what that is, it's a uh, collegiate summer league that college kids play in. Um, you have to be enrolled in college, and you have to have one year of eligibility left. Um, I happen to be uh, working out at the Reed Golf Course, uh, cutting grass. It's one of those things <laughs> I just wanted to get out of the house. And uh, Mike McDormand called me up and said, hey, uh, we got a guy that wants to bring a baseball team in here. Can you come and listen to this meeting? I was like, sure. So I get off the mower, and I get out of the meeting, and he goes, what do you think? I said, sounds legit. Well, next thing you know, I'm the general manager of the team, and I'm running the team. And I was like, I wanted to just cut I grass. Like, I was having fun riding the mower, man. But uh, but yeah, it's turned out pretty. It's turned out a lot better than I thought it was going to. And I'm learning a lot more about the game than I ever did. I'm now on the other side of the game compared to just being the player. And uh, you know, I've met more people in this city through it because um, the way that this team operates is through fundraising, which is a lot of smaller businesses anyway. It's mm -hmm. it's a for profit organization, but they don't make any money really, so it's like a nonprofit that you gotta you gotta raise your salary to get through there. Um, we've averaged, you know, last year we averaged four hundred and eighty six. This summer we averaged five hundred and thirty something, but we also had a lot of bad weather this summer. Yeah. Um, we sold a. Uh, out of our 30 home games, we had 27 group events. Last year, we only had three. So, I mean, the things are going to pick up with the team. Hopefully, the attendance picks up because if it doesn't, the team's going to leave. Well, um, there's nothing like hearing a wood, uh, like hearing a wood bat hit a baseball oh, in our you. city. It's, it's awesome. Just, it's, it's just a amazing. Totally different sound, yeah, isn't it? Instead absolutely. of that ping. I want to know: Have you ever yelled from the dugout? Forget the curveball, Ricky. Give him the heater. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have yelled from the stands, like, "Why aren't you throwing the freaking heater?" But uh, no, but I love that quote, and you know, maybe I should start using old one-line quotes because I had a bunch of them when I was playing too. From all the other guys, you'd sit there and listen to them yell at people out of the dugout, and and that's one of the things these college kids always ask me is like, "What's it like? You know, what's your favorite?" this or favorite that and I'm like you know I, I, everything went so fast for being 20 years of my life that I really got to sit and think about a lot of stuff because like I said that last six years I was so much on the move from city to city and a lot of it just kind of blurred yeah. so now I got to sit back and now I'm watching these kids and working with these kids and and I get time to think about stuff that's going on and what was what was going on and stuff like that but again if I lived in a big city I probably wouldn't be able to do it small town USA buddy I can sit back and have a beer and think about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like Springfield, USA. Yeah, like Springfield, yeah. USA. So we'll be back in just a second to play our weekly trivia game with Rick. But first, here's a word from our sponsor. Hey, everyone. Episode two of Springfield, USA is brought to you by our friends at Lee's Chicken. They've got exclusive deals at their e-club, www.leeschicken.net. You can register to win free food and other sorts of prizes and promotions. Matter of fact, we're actually running our own promotion in episode three, so you're going to want to stay tuned for that. Lee's Chicken, episode two, Springfield, USA. Well, welcome back. It's time to step in the ring with Davey Moore. This is our trivia game, weekly trivia game, where we, uh, we go three rounds. We give a multiple choice question. If you get one right, we take a punch. If we get it right... Or if you get it wrong, you take a punch. So you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. All right. I'm going right. to ding the bell with, with the World Series. The National League Championship. <laughs> all right. Question one. All three questions are dealing with Harvey Haddix, the okay. legendary pitcher. Legendary pitcher was born in Medway. Uh, 
Lived in St. Lived, Paris. Lived in St. Paris. Came up with Pittsburgh. Yep. So, question one. Harvey came into the league originally with St. Louis, and while in St. Louis, he got the, got the nickname. Was it either A, Harvey the Hyena Haddocks, for his strange yelping laugh, B, Harvey the Kitten Haddocks, or C, Harvey Hound Dog Haddocks, for his... I've got to go with C, and I should have known that, but I'm going to go with C. Harvey Hound Dog? Harvey Final answer. Dog. Final answer. Give him a punch. <laughs> I got knocked out. Left you got knocked out. Left hook. Left hook. Left hook. Left hook. Left hook. No, it's I'm Harvey the Kitten. The mound when Rick kitten? On the mound. Yeah. Really? Harvey the Kitten. Uh, it says here that he took his nickname from Harry the Cat, Burkeen, oh, the not. legendary pitcher for St. Louis. Harvey the Kitten. He yeah, looked I mean, like He him, was a little so fella, but I still wouldn't imagine, imagine being a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see if you can get it back. All right, um, here's a cougar. Question number kitten, two. Kitten. <laughs> question number two. So Harvey wins the World Series in 1960, playing against what team? He won two games, game five and one other game. Can you give me the name of the team and the game? <laughs> the answer is no, Pat. <laughs> was it A, was it A, the New York Yankees, the, the team that he was playing against? Was he playing against A, the New York Yankees? Was he playing against the Dodgers? Or was he playing against the Milwaukee Braves? Braves is the first thing that came to my head before you even said the three things, but I don't have any clue. <laughs> okay. 1960, the Pittsburgh Pirates played the New York Yankees in seven games. Harvey Haddock's won game five. I'm getting straight knocked out right now. I'm getting knocked out. Of the chin game on that seven. One. Yeah. Harvey Haddix was actually the winning pitcher of record when Bill Mazarowski won, uh, hit the home run in the bottom of the ninth, like the greatest home run ever. And I've got Harvey's um, old baseball cards and everything. I never yeah. knew all that. Yeah. Um, he was, was an avid outdoorsman. Did you know that? Yeah, he I did. Built, he built a beautiful farm with these, these ponds that are full of bass. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll actually do two more questions. Cause it's do all whatever, because I'm not trivia. doing very good. Okay, so you can, get, you can get back to this. Four rounds. He's against the ropes. Uh, question number three. Harvey Haddix currently owns the Major League record for what? Is it the most consecutive batters retired, the most hot dogs eaten, or the most... Uh, give me something else. The most uh, records recorded in the recording studio. <laughs> I'm going to go with A. A. A is correct. Uh. Chad takes it. I knew that one. <laughs> Thirty. He retired 36 batters. Uh, Still a record. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's and it ties into the last question. And he lost the game. Right. Which, so if you're going to ask that question, I know he lost. Okay. So Harvey <laughs> Haddix. Yes. Harvey Haddix also pitched a perfect game, uh, in which he retired all 36 batters and he lost it into the 13th inning yeah. against the Braves. Um, See why Braves were in my head? I knew yeah. there was something in there to double yeah. the Braves. All right, so you're not allowed to look, Rick. Actually, I didn't look on the last one. Oh, I just it? kept going with it. I had a feeling you were leading into it. <laughs> okay. But I won't look this time. <laughs> okay, so uh, so Harvey, how many golden gloves does he have? Did he have? Was it A, three, B, four, or C, just one? I always heard he was a really good fielder. Um, Funny thing is, is they give gold gloves back then. <laughs> I'm gonna go with three. Yeah, three is correct. Three-time All-Star, three-time Golden Glover. Nice. So yes. straight from Springfield. So I batted 500 right there. There you it's go. Not too bad. Pulled it out. Take that anytime. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Rick. We want to thank you for being on our show today. I uh, just really appreciate everything you've given back to Springfield. I appreciate that you're vested here and that you're uh, giving back to Champion City Kings, to Kenridge High School, to Wittenberg University. Uh, we have a gift for you and your family uh, from our friends at uh, Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken. Thank you, Scott. Uh, free dinner. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Scott Griffith. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode two of Springfield USA. Our guest was Rick White, the former major leaguer who loves Springfield. This is where he's from. Next week, join us for Arthur Solomon. He's from Russia. He's an immigrant. He went to Wittenberg. He's now a local business owner. Rick, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you, man. Chad, I'm charged for next week. Find us, Springfield USA.